Electricity overview. In this lesson, we're talking about the applications of electricity, the history, electrical current, direct versus alternating current, transformers, electrical potential, resistance, power and energy, and electricity cost. Applications of electricity. Electricity is all around us. We use it all day, every day, and our world will be very different without it. What I'd like you to do is come up with a definition for electricity and write it below. Applications of electricity. Think about and discuss where we get our electricity from. If there's no one around to discuss with, then just think about it yourself. Is this form of electricity generation good or bad for the environment? And what other methods could slash should we be using instead? A brief and incomplete history. So by no means am I going to go through the entire history of electricity, but I'm going to touch on some of the major points. So in the 1600s, William Gilbert first coined the term electricity. In 1729, Gray discovered the conduction of electricity. In 1733, Charles Francois de Fay discovered that electricity comes in two forms, which he decided was positive and negative. In 1752, Benjamin Franklin invented the lightning rod, which he used to demonstrate that lightning was electricity. The first battery was invented in 1800 by Volta. He proved that electricity could travel over wires. In 1820, Hans Christian Ostead confirmed that there's a relationship between electricity and magnetism. And Arago invented the electromagnet. In 1821, Michael Faraday invented the first electric motor. In 1826, George Simon Ohm wrote Ohm's Law, which stated the relationship between potential current and circuit resistance. In 1831, Michael Faraday developed the principles of electromagnetism, induction, generation, and transmission. The Edison Electric Light Company was created in 1878. And in 1879, the first commercial power station opens in San Francisco. In 1883, the electric transformer is invented, and Thomas Edison introduces the three-wire transmission system. In 1886, William Stanley developed the transformer and alternating current electric system. The rotating field AC alternator was invented by Nikola Tesla in 1888, and the electron was discovered officially by J.J. Thompson. Ernest Rutherford, in 1910, measured the distribution of electric charge within the atom, and Millikan took that a step further in 1913 by measuring the electric charge on a single electron. And in 1947, the transistor is invented. Now, again, that's not the entire history of electricity. But what I hope you can see is that our entire knowledge right now is based on what these giants of science discovered many, many years ago. We are certainly standing on the shoulders of giants when we talk about everything going forward from this point on. Electrical current. The electrical current is the flow of electrical charges, electrons. The movement of electrons is required for an electrical device to operate. The electric current is responsible for the transfer of electrical energy along the conducting wire. And there are two kinds of electric current, direct current and alternating current. Direct current, or DC. Direct current is the flow of electrons in only one direction throughout a circuit. So the electrons leave the battery and the current goes in a single direction. Current travels from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So that's the positive and that's the negative. Now electrons are actually going to flow in the opposite direction. So electrons are going to go this way, whereas current is going to go that way. Direct current electrons flow from the negative terminal, so that's what I was just talking about right there, to the positive terminal. The more free electrons that are moving in one direction, the greater the direct current. So once again, electric current is going to run from the positive to the negative, whereas the electrons are going to run from the negative to the positive. Direct current applications. DC power is widely used in low voltage applications. Everything that runs off a battery, plugs into the wall with an AC adapter, or uses a USB cable for power relies on DC. Examples include cell phones, flat screen TVs, flashlights, hybrid electric vehicles. In 1820, French physicist André-Marie Ampère performed experiments on direct current in wires. This is why today we use a symbol I and the unit Ampère, or A, to represent electric current. The equation that describes the amount of electric current is I is going to equal to Q over change in T. I is going to be in amps, Q is charge in coulombs, and T is time in seconds. Alternating current, or AC. Alternating current is the flow of electrons that instead of traveling in a single direction, simply move back and forth. So DC is going to have our electrons going from point A to point B, whereas AC is going to be a little different. We're still going to get a flow, a net flow of electrons from point A to point B, but the electrons themselves don't actually move. Remember, in DC, the electrons are going to actually move from here to there. But in AC current, our electrons are only going to shift slightly. So our electrons are going to move this way a little bit, and then it's going to move that way a little bit. As the electron moves to the right, it's going to cause the electron to the right of it to move a little bit, which is going to cause the electron to the right of it to move a little bit. But again, they're moving to the right, and then they move back to the left. So they have a net zero change in position, but they're still causing the electron beside it to move in that direction of the current. But they're still causing the electron to move in that direction. The time it takes to make one complete cycle of wavelength is called the period. So if our electron, again, was more like this, more like a stick, and our stick needs to move to the left, so it moves to the left first, so it looks like that, and then it moves to the right, so it's back up here, and then it moves to the right again, so now it's over here, and then it moves to the left, so now it's over here. So that's one, two, three, four. That's one complete cycle. The time to do that one complete cycle is the period. The number of cycles or periods per second is called the frequency. So if you do five complete motions, so from one to two to three to four, that's one cycle. If I do five cycles per second, then my frequency is five hertz. Homes typically utilize lower frequencies, such as 50 and 60 cycles per second, and much higher frequencies are used in things like television, radar communications, and cell phone operations, which can reach frequencies of 1,000 megahertz or 1 gigahertz. Check your understanding. Calculate the amount of current through a wire that has 0.85 kilohms of electrons passing a point in 2.5 minutes. Pause the video and answer this question. 
So our formula is i is equal to q over t, i, q over change in time. i is our question, q is 0 0.85, which we're told, coulombs, over our time. Now we're told 2.5 minutes. Now we know that there are 60 seconds per one minute. The minutes cancel out. You get 60 times 2.5, which is equal to 150 seconds. So we're going to put 150 seconds under here, and we're going to get a current of 0 0.0057 amps, which would also be equal to 5.7 milliamps. But why do we use AC instead of DC for transmitting electricity over long distances? Well, AC is used instead of DC to transmit power over long distances because it is more efficient and it doesn't lose as much energy to resistance. Because of the power loss, initial DC power grids could only transmit usable power over short distances. And that's how it used to be. DC was the first one to the market. DC was used to transmit power from the power stations to homes, but so much electricity was lost that they came up with a new solution. And that solution was alternating current. DC power transmission was soon replaced by AC systems that transmit power at very high voltages and correspondingly low current. Current systems transmit power from generators at hundreds of thousands of volts and use transformers to lower the voltage to 220 volts or 120 volts for individual customers. 220 volts are going to be people in Europe and actually a good part of the world as well. And 120 volts are going to be mostly for North America. So the reason that this is used is that low current is going to mean less loss. So high voltage means low current. So if we have low current, that's going to be good. Because if we have low current, we're going to get less loss of electricity as it goes from point A to point B. Step up transformers. Step up transformers increase the output voltage. It's used to increase the voltage for certain appliances and for voltage transmission across large distances. So for example, there's a step up transformer inside every microwave oven. The microwave oven is going to receive an input voltage of 120 to 240 volts, depending on where you live. And it's going to create an output voltage of around 5,000 volts. So you need that step up transformer to create the volts needed to cook your food. Step up transformers are also used in power plants to transform the several thousand volts produced by the alternators to the several hundreds of thousands of volts needed to reach your home. So the power plant is going to produce thousands of volts. Let's just call it 1,000 volts. But to get to your home, there's going to be power loss along the way. So we need to step up this 1,000 to, let's just say, 100,000. And that's going to then transmit to your home. So that if we do lose some, it's going to be okay because we're stepping up before it's going to be lost. Step-down transformers. As the name would imply, step-down transformers decrease the output voltage. A step-down transformer reduces the output voltage, or in other words, it converts the high voltage, so low current, into a low voltage or high current. For example, our homes have an input voltage of 110 volts to 220 volts, but your doorbell only requires 16 volts of electricity. A step-down transformer will therefore be used to reduce the voltage from 110 or 220 to 16 volts. It's also important as it's being transferred from the power station to your house, because in the transmission lines, it's 100,000 volts. We need to lower that to get to your home. Your home, remember, only has 110 volts. So we're going to need to use a step-down transformer to take it from 100,000 to 110. Electrical potential. Electrical potential is potential energy per charge at a specific location. So for example, how much potential energy a coulomb, so that's a large grouping of electrons, has at a particular location. The electron can give this energy to devices like lights and cell phones. Electric potential difference is also referred to as voltage. If electric potential is the potential energy per charge at a specific location, electric potential difference is the difference in electric potential between the final and the initial location. Let's just say at point A, we have 100 volts, and at point B, there's only 50 volts. That means the electric potential difference between point A and point B is 50 volts. This difference is created when work is done upon a charge to change the potential energy either by adding to or subtracting from. We could also go from B to C and have 150 volts. In this case, there'd be a potential difference of 100 volts between B and C. So A to B, that would be using energy, and B to C would be adding energy. Electric potential difference. Electric potential difference can be calculated using the formula V is going to equal to change in E over Q. V is the electric potential difference, joules per coulomb or volts. Change in E is the change in electric potential or joules. And Q is the amount of charge in coulombs. Check your understanding. Calculate the electric potential difference between two points in a circuit if a thousand joules of electric potential energy is used to move 150 coulombs of charge between them. Pause the video and answer this question. Okay, so let's see what we have. So V is our question. We're told that change in E is going to be 1,000 joules. And we know that Q is going to be 150 coulombs. So we're going to put V is going to equal to E, which is 1,000 over 150. And that's going to equal to 6.67 volts. We need two significant digits in our answer, so we're going to say 6.7 volts. Electrical resistance, or R, is a measure of how difficult it is for electric current to travel through a material. The unit for electrical resistance is the ohm. Electrical resistance. Some materials do not allow electrical current through easily, and therefore have a high resistance. Insulators, such as plastic and rubber, have a high resistance. Other materials have a low resistance, and they allow electrical current to pass through easily. Metals have a very low resistance, and therefore they are good conductors of electric current. Resistors are electrical devices that have a specific resistance. Keep in mind that every component in an electric circuit has an electrical resistance value. 
You can use different resistors and different devices to alter the amount of current that passes through. Devices that require a lot of current, like speakers, would utilize low-resistance resistors. Resistors work by converting some of the energy into other forms, such as heat and light. This byproduct is typically wasted, but not always. So, for example, light bulbs work by resisting the flow of current to produce light. As the electrons are passing through the wire, they're going to create a great deal of energy. As they get to the light bulb, a lot of that energy is going to be taken away, because the electrons are going to be slowed down. As the electrons leave, they're going to have much less energy than when they came in. Superconductors are special materials that have zero electrical resistance and therefore are extremely efficient. So how do you think superconductors would be useful? We just talked about the use of things that have a high resistance, but what about something that benefits from being low resistance? Ohm's law. The voltage in the conductor is proportional to the current if the temperature remains constant. V is even proportional to I. So how are current, voltage, and resistance equated? V is equal to I times R. R is the resistance measured in ohms. V is the electric potential difference or voltage measured in volts. And I is the electric current measured in amps. Check your understanding. What is the voltage if the current is 0.41 amps and the resistance is 61 ohms? Remember, V is equal to I times R. So I'd like you to pause the video and answer this question. So we are looking for voltage. We know the current is 0.41 amps and we know the resistance is 61 ohms. We're going to plug it into our calculation. We're going to plug those numbers into our formula. We're going to say that V is going to equal to 0.41 times 61 and that gives us an answer of 25.01 volts. We need two significant digits, so our final answer is going to be 25 volts. Power and energy. Power, P, is the rate at which energy, electrical energy in our case, is produced or consumed in a given time. The equation that describes power as P is going to be equal to the change in energy over the change in time, and it's expressed in watts, or W. Electrical devices have power ratings. Electrical devices have power ratings that tell the consumer how much energy they use and how much it will cost them to use. Electrical devices have power ratings that tell the consumer how much energy they use and how much it will cost to use them. Check your understanding. What power is required to charge a cell phone if 740 joules of energy is transferred in one minute? I'd like you to pause the video and answer this question. So power is our question. We're told that the change in E is 740 joules, and we're told that the change in time is one minute, which equals 60 seconds. P is going to equal to change in E, which is 740 divided by 60, and that gives us an answer of 12.33 watts. We need two significant digits in our answer, so our final answer is going to be 12 watts. Here's some common power usages. A coffee maker is going to use somewhere between 900 and 1200 watts, whereas something like a DVD player is going to use only around 20 watts. A toaster, 800 to 1400 watts. A laptop is only 50 watts. And a clothes iron is going to be upwards of 1800 watts. What kind of pattern do you see? What I'd like you to do is pause the video and try to identify the pattern, the kind of power usage by the kind of material that's using it. So the one thing that stands out to me, the high usage items, the dryer, the coffee maker, the hair dryer, the clothes iron, the oven, and the toaster, those are all things that generate heat, whereas things like the washing machine, ceiling fans, refrigerator, laptop, TV, these things don't generate heat, and they have much lower power. So we're going to say that creating heat equals a high power usage. Measuring electrical energy. Electrical energy is measured in units of kilowatt hours, kWh, because a joule is too small. If you break this down in kilowatt, that's going to be power, and the H is going to be time. So essentially, it's going to be power in kilowatts with 1,000 watts. 1,000 watts equals 1 kilowatt. So it's going to be power in kilowatts times the time that you're using it for. 1 kilowatt hour is equal to 3.6 million joules. A typical home in North America uses 1,000 kilowatt hours of electrical energy each month. Typically, power companies will charge you per kilowatt hour. So if you're going to use an appliance that, say, uses 10 kilowatts when it's being used, and you use it for one hour to make our math easy, then the amount of energy used by this device is going to be 10 kilowatt hours. Now, if the electric company charges you $0.1 per kilowatt hour, you're going to take your 10 kilowatt hour, multiply it by $0.1 per kilowatt hour, and that appliance is going to cost you $1 to use for that amount of time that you're using it for. Electrical energy pricing. Electricity prices fluctuate, but typically people will spend between 6 and 14 cents per kilowatt hour. Certain places have different rates depending on time of usage. So for example, you might have an off-peak, mid-peak, and on-peak, and they'd be priced accordingly. So something that's off-peak is only going to be 6.5 cents, whereas an on-peak usage is going to be 13.2 cents. You can save money by using more electricity during off-peak hours. Check your understanding. A long-range Tesla 3 has a battery size of 75 kilowatt hours. With a full charge, it can travel approximately 500 kilometers. How much will it cost to charge if you only charge your car during off-peak hours at a cost of 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour? So I'd like you to pause the video and answer this question. Okay, so what do we know? Well, we know that Tesla has a battery size of 75 kilowatt hours. 
every 75 kilowatt hours, it can travel 500 kilometers. How much will it cost to charge if you only charge your car during off-peak hours at a cost of 6.5 cents per hour? This question simply boils down to how much it's going to cost to charge it at what cost it's going to be to charge that. So we're going to say 75 kilowatt hours times 0 0.065 dollars per kilowatt hour. And that's going to give us a cost of 4.88 dollars for a full charge. That's pretty incredible. Continuing from the previous question, how much will you save if instead of charging your Tesla, you fill up your car, so tank size is 50 liters, at a cost of $1.10 per liter, if you fill slash charge up every other week, how much will you save over one year? How much will you save if you fill slash charge every week? So let's talk about every other week. So every two weeks, so that means you're going to fill up slash charge 26 times. If you do it every week, that means you're going to fill slash charge 52 times. So how much is it going to cost you each time you fill slash charge? So let's just talk about every two weeks to start with. So for the car, it's 50 liters, and it's going to cost $1.10 per liter. Now that's going to cost you $55, and we have to multiply that by 26, and we're going to get $1,430 total. For the Tesla, we just determined it's going to cost you $4.88 per charge, and you have to charge that 26 times. So 4.88 times 26 is $126.88. So the difference over one year is $1,303.12. That's how much more you're going to pay with a gas car over a Tesla. Now, if you charge every week, your car is going to be 55, because that's how much it costs to fill it up, times 52, which is 2860. Your Tesla is going to be 4.88 times 52, and that's going to equal to 253 and 76, and that's the difference of $2,606.24 per year. So as you can see, charging an electric vehicle during off-peak hours is going to save you a tremendous amount of money versus a traditional gas-powered vehicle. And that concludes our electricity overview lesson.